A week ago, my friends Michael Wozniak and Nathalie de Marseille had this amazing opportunity to interview Dr. Richard Bandler, the co-founder of NLP. And Michael allowed me to share some of my favorite parts from this interview and put them in this video right here to watch uh, uh, for you. Now, if after watching this video, you want to learn even more, I definitely recommend going over to Michael's channel. He's an amazing trainer in NLP, speed reading, mind mapping, a lot of other stuff. Uh, and he's going to be uploading a lot of valuable stuff on his channel. And also the entire interview, if you want to watch all of it it's more than two hours uh, go over to his channel and definitely uh, check that stuff out too so enjoy watching this video and i'll see you in the next one can change be permanent if you if you make a change can can it be permanent yes um, okay <laughs> un until you can change it to something even better um uh, Virginia Satir said to me once, if you don't have a choice, you can't make one. And uh, a lot of times, just the smallest thing happens and people end up in a terrible rut. Uh, years and early in my career, a psychiatrist brought me somebody. And I, to tell you the truth, the psychiatrist said to me, he said, his behavior is so pathological, I don't think even using hypnosis will help him. And, uh, you know, I've done so many things with hypnosis that I didn't even think were possible. I'm always willing to try. And he had, uh, according to the psychiatrist, fallen in a river when he was four or five years old. Somebody fished him out. He almost drowned. And then as time went along, he got to the point where, you know, he, he couldn't walk through a creek and then he couldn't go in a swimming pool and then he couldn't go in the bathtub and then he couldn't take a shower and you know, it got to the point where somebody turned on a water faucet and he'd start freaking out and, you know, and he washed himself with alcohol pads and, you know, it just became what the doctor called neurotic about it. And uh, when they told me the story, the psychiatrist was there and the patient was there and uh, the patient looked at me and he said, what do you think about all this? And I said, well, it seems like you're a quick study. You fell in a creek for a few minutes and you learn something that developed over the years. So all we have to do is teach you one little thing and pretty soon you'll be doing great. And uh, the shock on his face, because once I took him through what most neuro-linguistic programmers know you can do about phobias and fears, you shrink the size of the pictures down and blink them black and white really fast. And the neural synapse doesn't seem to run so well. And it's hard to get your fear back after a few minutes of doing that. And, uh, but you see, if we believe people can learn something and it sticks for years from, you know, a traumatic experience, then perhaps we can do something and believe that it will change them over the long run. Because the truth is in our lifetime, we have a whole lot of phone numbers. Phone number you had when you're a teenager, you don't have now. Now, if I hypnotize you, I can go back and get you to recall that. And all I have to do is age regress you and bring up your old telephone and you can see the number written on it. In my case, that phone is attached to the wall and has a dial that goes in a circle. Uh, it used to take 10 minutes to make a phone call. <laughs> you prayed for phone numbers with small numbers so you didn't have to wait for that dial to go around so long. But our ability to, to build new learnings, it's not that we forget things, it's that we put things on top of them. In uh, computer language, it's called a Turing machine. It's the name of the man. Uh, his last name was Turing. And it's like putting plates in a cafeteria. The first plate in goes down. You put another plate on top of it, another plate on top of it, so that the last plate comes up first. When we build new cortical pathways over numbers, over memories, over past experiences, we have to have the experience. So if somebody's terrified of water, I have to put an experience of water over the top of it, which is different, so that they can explore and find out than, for example, and learn to swim, which is always a good idea. Uh, I lived in Ireland, which is an island country, and amazingly, most of the people there couldn't swim because they didn't have a lot of swimming pools. It was too chilly in most places to have swimming pools. But uh, so people were always dropping in the ocean and drowning. But uh, some skills you want to have before you need them. Swimming is one of those. And our ability to learn should never be underestimated. No matter what age you are, I know 
people say you can't teach an old dog new tricks. Well, I was a dog trainer. I know you can teach dogs anywhere in their life. And people are almost as smart as dogs. <laughs> Absolutely. And uh, how can we start a lasting change? Start what? A lasting change, a change that is going to last. How can we well, start it? it, it, it here's the trick. It, it, you have to create a void and fill it. So you have to turn something down. And in most people, I start almost every seminar by talking about memories, how memories affect us. Some people have big, bad memories and they think about them two minutes here, three minutes there, five minutes here, you know, a little bit at night and sometimes during the day. And if you actually take the minutes and add them up, With some people, it's 30 minutes. With some, it's an hour. I've had people tell me four and five hours a day. They spend thinking about the same thing. Now, when you start calculating the amount of time that eats up, even an activity like worrying, if somebody worries two minutes here and three minutes there and four minutes here, even worrying about different things, if it adds up to an hour or two hours a day, the minute you start going, well, even at an hour, it's 365 hours a year. 3,650 in 10 years, right? And then when you multiply that by four decades, you start talking north of 10, 12,000 hours. And when you literally ask people, does that sound smart? Something hits them in the neurology that goes, no, it's not. And what they need to do is to take these big giant pictures in their head and shrink them down so that you know, they put a border around them, take control of their thoughts. Thinking should be done on purpose. You shouldn't be a victim of your own thoughts. But we really don't teach people growing up to control anything about their mind. Uh, you know, when you take piano, they teach you to control your fingers, but they don't teach you to worry, not to worry about what people think about your playing. Because nothing will cripple a musician more than worrying about whether or not they're going to make mistakes and whether or not people are going to like it or not, and all this nonsense. I mean, I had a guy who, who did a rock album and sold millions and millions of copies. And when he sat down to make his next album, he couldn't write a song because all he could think about was if it wasn't as good as the last one, nobody was going to like it. He had pictures of audiences hating him before he would start to pluck a single note. And that's not how he wrote the first album he had to go back to the state of consciousness he was in. Our state of consciousness controls how well we can learn things. We got to turn the nonsense down and then open up good ideas. We need to see ourselves in the future succeeding and almost reverse engineer our way back so that we know what path to take to become a better person, to become smarter, happier, more joyful, more functional. Uh, that's what I've always done. Um, remember, at one time, there were no houses. They're all made from somebody's imagination. There were no cars. First people imagine them, then they build them. Your life is no different. The, having an imagination, going into the future and seeing yourself in a new light, being happy, doesn't mean you're there, but at least tells you where to go. Now, if you can take some steps backwards, you have some achievable goals. Is it enough to change your beliefs in order to change at all? Um, no, but it's a good start. Um, that, you know, if, if you can't change big beliefs that people have into ones that work, uh, that, it, it, see, we all have something that interplays. The model we built in NLP is about strategies. There are learning strategies, there are motivation strategies, Uh, <clears throat> there are decision strategies and there are convincer strategies and they all interplay and overlap between each other. So our breaking them out is artificial only for the sense that we can learn about them and influence them. But when people become convinced utterly and absolutely that something is possible, then they have a tendency to really try and do new things that when you provide people an Uh, an undeniable reality, when that phobic gets in the elevator and they're not afraid, when the person who keeps thinking about the same memory and feeling overwhelmed has trouble remembering the same thing 15 minutes later, 
It's very convincing of people. And it affects our neurology in a powerful way. It puts us in a state of consciousness, which changes our neurochemistry and gets us ready to learn to do new things. There are certain states of consciousness where people acquire and pattern better. That, you know, learning is done by running things through you quickly in front of you. When you show people stick figures on a deck of cards, they see the stick figure fly, an uh, airplane flies in a circle. They have that on Virgin Airline when you fly, they give you a little pad and you go, and the airplane flies in a circle. Well, if I handed you one of those a week, once a week for five years, you would never know the airplane moved because you're not patterning it in your mind. Our brain patterns better when we have higher levels of oxytocin. Uh, they've done this artificially with autistic children. Uh, that's something doctors do. I'm not a medical doctor, so I don't do things like that. I do it with hypnosis. I do it with NLP. I induce states that raise people's oxytocin level. I get them to think dramatically different in a way that makes it almost difficult to get back to where they were. And I demonstrate this all the time on stages. And what happens is, is when people do something they don't believe they could do, it doesn't just change the belief, it changes their tendency towards emotion so that they begin to do new things and try new things. It becomes a convincer because if you're wrong about this, then the question is, what else are you wrong about yourself? And you begin going back to testing whether or not things are the case. That when you feel overwhelmed with fear, you just can't get in the elevator or on the escalator or in the airplane or walk up to strangers and talk to them or walk out of your house in the case of agoraphobics. But when people become convinced and they do something they couldn't do, it collapses a lot of generalizations. And the truth is every time you reinforce a belief that you have, it's a little less. By the time you have a hundred examples, the next one increases its credibility very, very little. And when you have a thousand examples of something, that last thing, but man, when you have a big counter example, it kind of blows the whole thing apart so that it doesn't work. And I mean, doesn't run automatically the way it would. It just doesn't keep looping. You could relearn it. You can always go back and relive the same things and build it back up in your head. But for those moments afterwards, if you begin to stick new ideas in there and new patterns, people end up with a choice. And you know, you could be afraid or you could laugh at something. And laughing, laughing at stupid things is a lot better than doing them. <laughs> Always a better choice. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's, that's at the top of my list. Laugh at stupid things, <laughs> try not to do it. And certainly try not to do it again and again and again. Absolutely. Jean-Philippe from France, related to this, is asking, what are the best ways to stop internal dialogue. Internal dialogue is being- Okay, here uh, we go again. The best. The, okay. the best, the only, the greatest, uh, <laughs> all of those quick words. There are a thousand ways, but first you have to stop out. Okay, if, if you, it's not about stopping your internal dialogue. It's about using it when, you sh when, it will, when it's worth having. And if any process, I don't care if it's a feeling, a picture, or sounds, when it's out of control, the first thing to do is to make it go faster, then make it go louder, then make it go softer, then make it go slower so it talks even slower and slower, and then do three words on, three words on, three words on, so that you take control over it. Take the voice from this side, move it to this side, move it to the back, move it to the front. Make it sound like Daffy Duck, uh, so that you begin to control your own internal neurology. It's a very bad habit that most people have that they just let their brain run on. It's like having a car with no steering wheel. Your job is to be in charge of your consciousness. That light that shines in the dark, right, that decides what you pay attention to and what you don't, right, should be something you're in control of. And most people aren't. Their feelings jump all over the place and they make pictures. Sometimes they don't even see them. And, you know, whether they're big and whether they're small, it's like anything else. You practice, practice, you get good at it. You know, if your internal dialogue is just jabbering on, 
right? Have it jabber on. You don't even have to change what it says. Change the tone of voice first. Make it sound like a professor the cat, fucker and fuck attack. I'm an idiot, you know? You'll never be able to shut up. You'll never be able to shut up. And then make it get really loud and then get it quieter. And then have it do three words and three spaces and three words till you take control. It's like anything else. When you practice taking control of things, it's your brain. You're in charge of it. It's the one thing you could control more than anything is your thoughts. And you can't control them by suppressing them. You need to control them by controlling them. And it doesn't matter if, if you say really crappy things to yourself and they make you feel bad. Well, the first thing is, is change the way you feel, then keep saying the crappy shit, say it really loud, and then make it sound stupid as it is. And eventually, you'll get a little silence in there. <laughs> Thank you, Richard. Yeah, very, very good advice. Very good advice. And there's always that mantra, you know, shut the fuck up, shut the fuck up, shut the fuck up. Shut the fuck up, shut the fuck up, shut the fuck up. And that works great. That works really great, actually. So yeah. simple solutions for simple problems. <laughs> um, you, you talked about hypnosis before. Can, can you tell uh, a few words about the, the importance of the unconscious mind? And this will be the last question. Ever? <laughs> uh I, when I started doing hypnosis, I, I have to admit that I didn't know, I didn't know much about it. I'd been hypnotized once when I was a kid by a magician, you know, after he pulled a rabbit out of a hat, he hypnotized three people and asked for volunteers. And uh, I, 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 I didn't even know what it was. I'd never even seen anybody do it. I was probably in the sixth grade at the time. And I remember feeling more relaxed than I don't think I felt again until I was in my 20s. And uh, it was just something that when it came up, and I remember one day John Grinder said to me, he just looked at me and he said, I'd like to learn to be a hypnotist. We should learn this. I went out and I bought a hundred books on hypnosis, some from used bookstores, some were from the 1800s, some were paperbacks and, you know, some were good, some were garbage. And uh, next thing you know, we were starting to do hypnosis. And then Gregory Bateson, who is a very famous intellectual who was responsible for the double bind theory of schizophrenia, lived across the driveway from me. And when he said, what are you doing? I said, I'm learning hypnosis. His pupils dilated. And he looked at me and he goes, you must meet Milton Erickson, MD of Phoenix, Arizona. And I went, okay. And uh, he set up an appointment for us to go about three months later. And John and I got on a plane and flew down and started doing experimental hypnosis. And it changed the direction of everything. And in some ways gave birth to the whole field of NLP. Because when I hypnotized people and made them have perfect pitch, and, uh, and then when I brought them out of trance, they didn't have perfect pitch. I hypnotized people and they could uh, do all kinds of things that they couldn't do when they were in the waking state. I had somebody uh, imagine glasses, take their glasses off and imagine their glasses and they could see without their glasses. And when they came out of trance, they couldn't. It didn't make any sense to me that, you know, if your brain can do this in trance, how come it can't do it in the waking state? So we started going through methodically to try to get, find a way to get a person's conscious mind to just alter itself in the same way it did. And as it turns out, it had more to do with the brainwave patterns and all kinds of things. And uh, as we explored those, I discovered that hypnosis was a great doorway to finding and expanding the possibilities of what people could do. And that I really discovered that there was kind of a thing going on where when you talk to the conscious mind, you could talk to the unconscious simultaneously. That really our, our, our ability to consciously understand language is supported by a whole structure as Chomsky laid out, but that that unconscious process more than the unconscious mind. I think when we say, at least in English, your unconscious learns, your unconscious understands, it's more of a command than anything else. We're telling people to be less conscious, to be unconscious. And uh, that to me, 
I know that there are all kinds of unconscious processes that can be accelerated and exaggerated and give, give me the ability to communicate in ways that allow people to have better freedom of possibility. See, uh, the funny thing is, is I believe that freedom is absolutely what it's all about. That, you know, once a society, and, and there are societies where people are not terribly free, and uh, that, that's a, on this day and age, that's, that's a horrible shame. But once people have warm, full, and dry, I think the big chains they have are in here. And the change of, chains of modern society are that people are not breaking the generalizations and expanding their worlds into being better places, into being better people, into being kinder and nicer and more entrepreneurial. Uh, you know, that uh, especially in these times, I have a lot of people telling me, you know, the government is giving us big checks, so I don't want to go back to work, I'll take a pay cut. And I'm thinking, well, whoever did this is nuts. You know, we want the world to, we want the world to be excited to go back to work. My, I want my employees to be excited to go back, that, you know, that we should feel like, we, you know, we had to do this to become a better planet, a cleaner planet, a more sterilized planet, and to overcome the, overcome the big bad virus. And, you know, the world should be unifying and ganging up on the virus. And, you know, instead of blaming each other and going through all this nonsense about who gave each, who's, whose mistake is this and who's doing it better than whom and all this nonsense they're going through. Uh, to me, I've not, I've not got time for that. Uh, I, I want to see people at this point really start to go, okay, what can I believe that will be more functional and building those beliefs. And one of the best ways to do that is to understand that most of what you do, how you feel and what you think comes out of automated unconscious processes from your neurology, which is not separate from your body. By the way, there is no mind body split. You know, if you ain't got one, you ain't got the other. And I know a lot of people ask me that intellectual question. I, I just think that's nonsense. Uh, to me, understanding that that's true means how do we take the light of our conscious mind and fill more of our life with the light from morning, noon, night, and in our dreams? And how do we go into the future and make better plans so that we think more on purpose and live more on purpose? And uh, instead of running away from everything that scares us, we should, be, we should be building our dreams and building our desires and embracing the future. Because after all, that's really all there is.